Michelle, are you there? Hi, uh, yeah, sorry, I was in the bathroom. It's okay, I was also in the bathroom. Um, I, it said it had signed me out, so I got worried that one or the other of us wasn't actually here, but we're both here, so. Uh, so I didn't know you could use, um, uh, you could like do, I think it's the same account on two different computers at the same time. I think you can have like up to a certain number but like we couldn't be in two different meetings. Like if you were to be logged in as the Y and try to enter a different meeting, that would cause trouble. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Like yeah. if you forgot to sign out. But like there were like Rebecca was like, oh, that's why it crashed. But I was like, mm, in my interviews, I multiple times saw multiple people listed as the Y, mm -hmm. like in the Y account. So I don't know what that um, yeah was about. Um. um. So I so when you tried um okay, well first of all it'll show us if someone is in the waiting room, right? I don't know how it works because we're in the broadcast thing. I don't know. Like yeah, like in terms of Aaron. Right. I, like I don't know if we need to like exit the practice session to see him mm -hmm. um because i only know how it works with the well here let me ask eric to try to join or something let me see if eric can do that um because then we would see right mm -hmm. or i can ask jen let's see Stop. I don't know what, like, I hate when things have those. Oh, <laughs> oh you can't. Uh, hey, Jen, we need you. I need you to not be logged in as the Y when you try. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I didn't think about that. <laughs> It'll take her a second to. Do you know if he's using PowerPoint? I have no idea. Oh, hey, Mike. Can you log in as yourself instead of the Y? Because otherwise, you're a host and people see you. Hey, I just don't mean to interrupt you. Just want to say good luck. Oh. I'm. Uh, Switching over to investment committee, so I hope it goes well. Okay. Is this recorded? It will be recorded. It's actually being recorded right now. <laughs> oh. All right. Go. Um, you know, this is a really strange time, and um, we are trying to adapt in the ways that we can and and make this an accessible um, forum the way it has been for the past ninety years. Um, and so I want to thank you all for. Um, attending this virtual Friday Forum. It means a lot to us. Um, so this semester's Friday Forum is the state of our democracy. So in an election year, we wanted to zoom out and think about the larger picture of what our nation looks like right now. Um, we wanted to think about the ways that people are participating both in and outside of the polls. Uh, we wanted to consider all of the forces that shape our democracy um, whether that's voting or protest or um, presidential memorandums, all of these things. So um, we are excited that today is our launch. Um, and so we are really honored to have County Clerk um, Aaron Ammons with us today to talk about voting in the 2020 election um, and the work he and his office have been doing. Um, and I also want to give a sh quick shout out to our uh, sponsors of the series. So Gender and Women's Studies, thank you. Um, and we have more sponsors coming up, but I can't bring them up right now. 
Um, but yeah, and so I want to encourage everyone to save their questions till the um, till the end of the session and um, or the end of Clerk Ammon's talk. And if you want to use the Q and A um, part of the webinar feature on Zoom, I will be keeping an eye on that. And with that, it's my honor to introduce Clerk Ammons. Um, Aaron Ammons has spent almost two decades working as a community organizer. He worked at the University of Illinois for 17 years and was president of the SEIU. He served as an Urbana alderman before being elected as the first African-American Champaign County Clerk in 2018. Clerk Ammons is passionate about voting rights and has made it his mission to provide fair, free, and accessible elections for all voters. So thank you, Clerk Ammons. Um, and with that, the floor is yours. Thank you, Michelle. I appreciate that. Uh, Casey, both of you, thank you for the invitation from the Y. I appreciate being a part of Friday Forum. It's been a long time for me. I think I did this a long time ago. It's been, it's been a while. So I'm excited to be here, always excited to talk about voting and the importance of voting, uh, how it plays out and how it affects our daily lives. I'm gonna do a quick uh, presentation, slideshow presentation or PowerPoint uh, that I'll share with you all now. And then I'll walk through that and then open up for any questions afterwards. All right, can everybody see the screen there? Yes? All right, good. So again, I'm Aaron Ammons, the Champaign County Clerk. As was said before, I was elected in 2018 and uh, I've been in office for almost two years now. I tell everybody we're still drinking out the fire hose because there's so much to learn about running an office like this. Lots of people campaign and run for office, but running the entire election is a different, different process. So of course we want to talk about the importance of voting and uh, which is something that I really, really love to, to discuss. All right, so a little bit about me, I work at the university, I'm a trustee for the for SERS, for the State University Retirement System. I was a councilman. I'm also married to uh, Representative Carol Ammons, and if I didn't say that, I don't know how long that would last, so I wanted to make sure that I got that in also. And being passionate about voting rights is certainly an understatement for me. Uh, just a little bit of history. I know we just celebrated the 100-year anniversary of, of women getting the right to vote, um, but uh, one of the things that I challenge as we talk about these types of situations or types of uh, monumental uh, legislation that was passed, uh, to say that women in the United States were granted the right to vote in 1920 is not accurate because African American women, women of color were not given that right at that time. Uh, it was only Caucasian women who were allowed to vote from the 1920 passage of the 1920 law. So I, I do think it's important that we talk about, especially in today's time with the uprisings and the Black Lives Matter movement, all of the different things that are taking place, history should reflect what happened and it should be documented accurately and race should not be ignored. Uh, of course, we can talk about the history of the voting rights uh, uh, for African-Americans and talk about the, you know, a lot of people are not aware that African-American men were given the right to vote uh, during Reconstruction, and it resulted in quite a bit of, of change and uh, having African-American senators and things like that, but it was only for African-American men. So twice African-American women were excluded from this process and uh, denied uh, access to the polls, whether it was the women's right to vote or the African Americans initially and during Reconstruction. It wasn't until 1965 when um, uh, all people of color, uh, a lot of people missed the fact that as African Americans were on the front lines with their allies fighting for the right to vote, it also opened the opportunities for all people of color to have access to voting in the United States. And it's an extremely important piece for us to understand as we talk about democracy because uh, many can argue that we still don't have democracy in the United States, but certainly we could not argue and could not put forth that democracy existed prior to 1965, because you can't disenfranchise your citizens and then claim to have a democracy. Uh, so looking at the history of voting rights, 
you can look at uh, one of the important topics as we talk about disenfranchising people and whether or not you actually have a democracy. You can look throughout the states here and you can see uh, dealing with individuals with felony convictions. And I always want to always say very clearly to everyone in the state of Illinois, I've gone through this process. I know this process. Individuals who have felony convictions in the state of Illinois, you can vote please help amplify the accurate information because I watch TV, I see various different documentaries and they still don't clarify that the rights for people with felony convictions are different from state to state. And in Illinois, your voting rights are restored after you serve your prison term. So an individual who is currently being detained in a county jail they can still vote because they have not been convicted. They have not been found guilty of the crime for which they are being detained. So there's lots of information around this. And as you can see, uh, it varies from state to state from may lose your vote permanently, votes restored after prison parole and probation, vote restored after prison and parole, vote restored after prison, and then unrestricted, you may vote from prison. Uh, and uh, Vermont and, and Maine, which I think makes sense, but that's another story. Uh, one of the things that's very important for us to talk about now is, I know the university talks a lot about civic engagement. Uh, I like to really invoke the spirit of my mentor, who was the director of direct action for the civil rights movement, who talked to us a lot about civic duty, that you are duty bound as a citizen to do certain things. So I like these quotes here. Too many people fought too hard to make sure all citizens of all colors, races, ethnicities, genders, and abilities can vote. To think that not voting somehow sends a message. So uh, Luis uh, Gutierrez talks about this and, and it's interesting to me that somehow individuals think that they're sending a message by not voting when what you're actually doing is um, sort of forfeiting all your tax dollars and the authority that you have as a tax paying citizen. And then of course, John Kennedy's, the ignorance of one voter in a democracy impairs the security of all. It is imperative that we educate our citizens, our children, all folks. And when I say citizens, I'm talking about people who are here uh, and whether you are undocumented or not, I'm talking about human beings, but certainly those who have the ability to participate in the democracy and to actually vote. Uh, we want you to be as informed as possible. Otherwise, you create clicks and you create what we see today. Why every vote matters. There's a couple of things. Here's a direct example of why every single vote matters. Uh, a recent saw, uh, a recount sought an Illinois sheriff's race with one vote margin. This was just the 2018 election in which I was elected. So in Decatur, Democrat candidate Tony Brown received 19,655 votes and the Republican Jim Roots got 19,654 votes. So out of 39,000 plus people who voted, it was decided by a single vote. So yes, every vote matters. Every vote matters also because whether or not your candidate wins, that 19,654 people who voted for Mr. Jim Roots, Tony Brown is well aware that when it's time for re-election or when it's time for service as the sheriff, he has to appeal to those 19,654 people who voted for Jim Roots. It is, it is abundantly clear to him that he must do that if he was not aware prior to winning the office. What I'm saying to you all is that your participation creates activity, meaning the, an elected official is going to spend their time and resources in places where they see a voter turnout because the objective is to win by votes. So if any individual sees a segment of the population who votes at a 5% rate or less, or you know, some low number, 
and they compare that to an area in the community that votes at a 55 or 65 percent clip, it's not hard to figure out where that elected official is going to spend the bulk of their time and resources. And they'll understand the issues of that group of people who turn out to vote on a regular basis far greater than they understand the issues of the individuals who don't turn out. So your participation in voting is not always about winning or your candidate winning. It's also about participation itself. Uh, elections have consequences. I, I think that is uh, abundantly clear to everyone today that elections have consequences. You do need to spend time. I'll give you a quick story about my wonderful wife, Carol Ammons. Uh, and I, I mean this in the most sincere way. We were interviewing, a group of men were interviewing a potential candidate uh, for an office here locally. And the person came in and gave us a nice stump speech about what they would do if they were elected. And a question was posed to this potential candidate. What have you been doing? Because we can look at what you've been doing and get a real good example, a good clear determination of what you're going to do based upon what you've been doing for the last two years, five years, or 10 years in the community. And he said, see, we had no problem understanding what work Carol Ammons would do as the state representative because we had years of examples of what she was doing before she became state representative. So elections have consequences. Pay attention to um, the individuals who are running. So while presidential elections get the most attention, the smaller and local elections actually have a greater impact on your day-to-day -day life. So you definitely want to pay attention and by local, that means city council, county board, school board, et cetera. Um, what is the county clerk doing to ensure fair, free, and accessible elections? Here's an example of a little overweight Aaron out there on, on a quad day. But that's me as the clerk, not as a candidate. As the clerk out here on a hot, sunny day, on quad day interacting with these students because that's what I believe in. So I'm not going to just say some things, you'll see me acting them out. And this is us in our booth. And this is Matt giving a high five to a student who has registered to vote. So our outreach is um, before COVID was tremendous. We were everywhere. Places, whether it's a small crowd or a large crowd like this, we want to be in that space where you can see your election authority, you can see the clerk's office, and see the passion that we have for voter participation. I'll spend a few minutes talking about the Safe Vote Coalition that we have formed, especially amidst this COVID uh, pandemic. The Safe Vote Coalition, uh, our objective is to highlight the safest way to vote during this pandemic, which is to vote by mail. That way you have no reason to, have, to come in contact with another potential uh, carrier of COVID and you don't have to worry about spreading it if you, are a, if you are asymptomatic or if you have COVID. So the safest way to vote during this pandemic is to vote by mail. So the coalition made up of uh, the clerk's office, uh, the CU Public Health District, the administrator there, Julie Pride, uh, Mayor Finan, League of Women Voters, NAACP, AFSCME Council 31, SEIU Local 73, First Followers, Win Recovery. Oh my goodness, just so many different. Um, uh, we have sororities and fraternities, uh, When We All Vote, lots of different organizations at, at various different levels who participate in the Safe Vote Coalition. And we share the information about the safest way and the safest ways to vote. The second, the next safest way to vote is to vote early. Voting early means that you'll have, uh, you'll be in line, but you'll be in line for a lot shorter period of time if there's a line. You won't have to come in contact with as many people. You can be in and out uh, in basically, we say record time if you start uh, when, when early voting begins on September 24th. So early voting is the next safest way to cast your ballot during this pandemic. The least safe way to vote is to wait until the last day. 
if you wait until the last day to vote, and I know I'm talking to a bunch of university students and different people who may have a tendency to procrastinate, do not wait until the last day to vote because you're gonna have longer lines, you're going to be exposed to more people for longer periods of time and the likelihood of, some, uh, of a spread or contracting the disease is it increases by the amount of time that you'll be there. Now we're going to enforce the social distancing to the best of our abilities. There'll be masks available for, for voters who come in to vote as well as the judges who will be required to wear masks, um, hand sanitizer and all those things. But the reality is if you wait until the last day, uh, that is the least safe way for you to vote because of the amount of exposure. All right. Uh, part of our election security, which is a big deal as the election authority, um, while I uh, wholeheartedly uh, disagree with some of the fraudulent and misinformation that is being put forth by, whether it's coming from the White House or other individuals who are talking about um, massive fraud and things like that that take place through the elections, it's just not true. The data does not support that. Um, while there is, there are cases of attempted voter impersonation, the vast majority of the cases that we see where a person has attempted to vote twice or something like that are mistakes. And that's what all the data shows. That's what, um, that's what we see from, uh, from study to study. So what we have done uh, around election security, we have purchased new software as well as new hardware. So uh, when I took office, we were using software from Windows XP in some of our processes here. And some of you who understand computers knows just how outdated that is. I also came and took over this office with equipment that is no longer manufactured. I'll just let that set in. Windows XP and equipment that is no longer manufactured is what I walked into. So we have used grant funding to procure a new vote by mail system, a new voter registration system. Uh, we use that money to get more equipment to help make the process more efficient. We have purchased a mail sorter machine as well as a OPEX mail opener. Uh, so we have quite a few things that we've purchased to try to make this process more efficient and to also save taxpayers money. Uh, we do cybersecurity training for uh, the staff through the Cyber Navigators program and STIC. And uh, the question I get asked the most is, will we ever stop using paper ballots? Not as long as I'm county clerk, we will not. The paper ballots create a paper trail. So if anything goes wrong with the computer systems, we will always have the paper ballots to go back and count them by hand if necessary. Now, I do think with the legalization of marijuana and hemp, it would be great if hemp growers would make paper out of hemp instead of all of our trees. All right, voter education. Whew. This is a huge task because there's so many people to reach and so much information that I could share. So educating voters on the election process, um, we're doing the best that we can through social media, through, um, we've got bus ads and everything that we possibly can do to get information out. We have short clips and videos that we put out to share information. But uh, again, we're promoting that you take advantage of the early voting uh, and, and the vote by mail in particular. And vote by mail and absentee are the same in Illinois. I know a lot of people, again, these talking points that are coming from uh, the White House and other places to try to mix people up. In Illinois, vote by mail and absentee is the same thing. For years, people who voted absentee were um, forced to give a reason, some sort of excuse, why they should have access to mail-in voting. Um, but now you do not have to make any excuse. You do not have to have a reason at all. You can just say, I want to vote by mail, and you are allowed to do so. A lot of people are not aware that we have been voting by mail since the Civil War. Soldiers have been voting in particular by mail since the Civil War, and hundreds of millions of, of American citizens have voted by mail over the last 20 years. Um, a big part of our voter education is training our election judges who have a tremendous task when trying to help facilitate an election. 
we couldn't have an election without election judges. So I do strongly encourage anyone watching to go to the website, champagncountyclerk.com, uh, click on the elections drop down menu and, and sign up to be an election judge. We need judges to do drop box pickups, vote by mail uh, processing election, the uh, November 3rd, the last day to vote, which many people call election day. Uh, we need people to serve in, 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 on those days as well. Uh, we are partnering with the community organizations and different organizations uh, all across, as I mentioned earlier, with the Safe Vote Coalition, but we're also partnering with the U of I. We have a, a task force who meets uh, every Wednesday for around civic engagement, and I push them on using the word civic duty, not just a civic engagement as well. So we have a lot of uh, uh, partners who we're working with, NTD and, and various different entities. Uh, so we are using social media through Twitter and Facebook in particular, uh, Instagram. I think we're trying to get up to the times of TikTok and, and some of those other things as well. But that's where you can find a lot of information is on our new website, champagncountyclerk.com, as well as our social media pages, uh, Facebook in particular. 2020 election, request your vote by mail now. Do it now if you're interested in voting by mail, which again is the safest way to vote during this pandemic. And for those of you who have concerns around vote by mail, again, as an African-American man, studied the civil rights movement, you see Dr. King behind me, I would not tell you to vote by mail if I felt like it was going to jeopardize your vote. So early voting starts September 24th, and that is also the first day that we can begin mailing your ballots to you if you have applied and requested a vote by mail ballot. So we say request early, return early. Request your vote by mail ballot now. Go online, champagncountyclerk.com, fill out your uh, vote by mail application so that you can uh, get in the queue. And if you are part of this queue leading up to September 14th, if you've got your stuff uh, online, if you filled out your application up to September 14th, you will be a part of that first wave of ballots that go out on September 24th. And it's important that you understand that because the sooner you apply, the quicker you will receive your ballot and the more time you will have with your ballot. You'll have time to research your candidates, have time to research the referenda questions that will be on your ballot. So it gives you more time to look at those things. You don't have to be rushed. And then once you finish it, then you can simply put it in the mail or you can put it in one of these seven conveniently located drop boxes that I will talk about here in a little bit. So uh, the, early, the other early voting locations open on October 19th. So September 24th is when early voting begins here at the Brookings Administrative Building in the gymnasium. And that early voting will last from September 24th all the way to October 16th. So, and it's only Monday through Friday. We will not do weekends during the period of September 24th to October 16th, okay? So no weekends during that time. But picking up on October 19th, it will be uh, an all day thing, an all day affair basically um, in our office from 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. here at Brookings but the other locations will be open from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Monday through Friday, 10 to 3 on Saturday, and 1 to 5 on Sundays. Of course, general election day is November 3rd. Uh, we are anticipate, anticipating an unprecedented turnout this year due to various different reasons, vote by mail, as well as the uh, heightened attention around the presidential races and many of the local races as well. Uh, I spoke to you about recruitment of election judges. Please sign up. Make sure you vote and make sure that everyone you know votes as well. Uh, we always encourage you, if you're going to take the time to get your ballot and to, to come and vote, to research your, your candidates, research the issues, and vote your whole ballot. All right, so thank you all for listening to that uh, brief presentation. I encourage you to give us a call if you have information and uh, questions, 384-3720, 384-3720. And please check us out uh, at the new website, champagncountyclerk.com.
All right. Thank you, Clerk Ammons. Um, so we are going to move into the question and answer period. So the first question we have is from George and he um, is asking, what is going on to ensure that U of I students are registered? Is there anything happening with the university structures to make sure students are all registered? Yeah, so uh, the typical process that we've seen in the past has been uh, trying to do quad day and do paper registrations. Uh, we have a QR code that we have shared with several different organizations and with our committee at the university to get the students to register online. They've got a turbo vote initiative, a big 10 initiative um, that the university is passionate about. We're seeing involvement and uh, participation at the highest levels of the university from the president to the chancellor um, and, uh, and as well as lots of the student organizations. Who are, who are excited about the upcoming election. So we're doing everything that we can to get them registered in time for the upcoming election. Thank you. Um, Mark is asking, how does voter turnout in Champaign County compare to that of Illinois, of the United States, of other democratic countries? Um, <laughs> and, what, uh, and what was voter turnout in November 2016? All right. So uh, some of this information I'd have to pull from, uh, from the old data to see. Uh, the 2016 turnout, I think it was like 84,000 or 88,000 people who participated in the 2016 turnout. Uh, I anticipate that we're gonna be upwards of 90,000 people in this election. We already have 20,000 people who have requested vote by mail ballots um, and, and we're just getting started. We just started the promotionals and everything around that. Uh, comparing to Illinois and to some of the other countries, the democratic countries, I don't have all that information in front of me, but it's a good, um, I, I, I'll look into that and I can get some information back out to you all about that. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I'm sorry, Michelle, I would say that, um, you know, Illinois does have some of the more progressive uh, policies as it relates to voting and, and getting people engaged same day registration, the grace period. Now we have the uh, vote by mail, SB 1863, which has expanded vote by mail access. So I do think that Illinois is, um, is in a good place. Uh, we could do more, but I think we're in a good place as far as uh, inspiring or trying to uh, get people to turn out to vote in, in, in the state of Illinois. Thank you. Um, Mark is also asking, if someone contests an election and it ends up requiring a recount, how long would it take to recount all of those paper ballots and to get them reported to the state level to allow final results? Hmm. So we have to do what's called a retab, uh, which is a random selection of five different precincts plus an early voting location that is sent to us by the State Board of Elections. And depending on the size of the precinct that is chosen, then we will have, to, uh, it, it may take a little bit longer to do those recounts, um, to do the retabulation. Uh, but we have the machines that we, that we use, the tabulators, the DS200, and we'll have to feed those machines. And it would take more time whenever we have to do those retabs, but it's the type of, or, or recount, it's the type of thing that I think makes the uh, individuals involved, the candidates who are involved, feel more comfortable that someone has actually laid eyes on those ballots and to see what the count is if you have to do an actual visual uh, hand count. But uh, running it back through the machines, we're talking about military grade encrypted uh, thumb drives and machines that are uh, now that I have are the newest models of DS200s. So it's a somewhat of a lengthy process, but it's necessary for democracy. Thank you. Um, Lisa is asking, do you count ballots, so related to counting ballots, um, do you count ballots as they come in or does the counting process take place only on election day? Yeah, so we do not count ballots as they come in. Uh, the law allows us to cast some ballots as they come in. So individuals who are voting by mail, uh, if they come in, if, as those ballots come in to us from the post office box or any of the drop boxes that we will have around town, when we pick those up, we are allowed to scan them in, date them, uh, check, do the signature verification, 
and we can open them and cast them into the tabulator because casting them into the tabulator does not uh, count them because it, it only tells you how many ballots are in that machine. It does not tell you how many votes have been cast in each particular race until you actually run the report. Uh, and you have to run those reports at the close of the elections after 7 p.m. on election day, on November 3rd in this case. Thank you. But this is also a process that is open to poll watchers and candidates to come in and watch uh, the process there's always a Democratic and Republican election judge there throughout that entire process to make sure that eyes of both of the um, established parties uh, is present and able to keep an eye on the process. Uh, Mark Alexander is asking, um, during the 2018 primaries and midterms, there were concerns regarding the number of available precincts and universal voting locations for students with some locations seeing lines in the hundreds and wait times of several hours. Has anything been done to address this issue and or do you expect in-person student turnout to be mitigated by the pandemic? Mm, great question. Uh, you know, we all saw and were embarrassed by the students being, uh, first of all, being asked to vote on the fourth floor of the Illini Union and then seeing the line wrap all the way down to the first floor. Um, it, was, it was embarrassing. Uh, to see that, and that's not the type of investment that we should have in our elections for anyone, uh, whether it's students or any other individuals who are voting here in Champaign County. Uh, so I was not the clerk at that time, I was running at that time, and what I did immediately upon being elected is to establish a different relationship with the University of Illinois, and in the 2019 and in the 2020 uh, elections, we voted on the main floor, the first floor of the Illini Union in the Pine Lounge room. And this year it will be in room 104, directly adjacent, uh, I would say directly opposite of the Pine Lounge room, but is the same size as the Pine Lounge. And the, uh, the way it will be laid out is that we will have social distancing, but we will not see students wrapped around uh, four flights of stairs all the way down to the first floor. One of the other things that I've done in, in expectation for that, in anticipation for a large in-person student turnout, is I also uh, approached the YMCA, which is just right down the street from the Illini Union, and asked them to be an early voting location as well to help alleviate some of the pressure uh, that I anticipate happening uh, in, at the Illini Union. Uh, the next thing that I did is I approached the ARC and asked the ARC to be an early voting location and so the ARC will be an early voting location in multi-purpose room five, which is on the main floor of the ARC. So there'll be three locations for early voting for the students on campus, um, as well as we strongly encourage even the students to, uh, to entertain the notion of voting by mail. So uh, there's a drop box on the quad, uh, on the it will be one on the quad, it's not there yet. It will be installed here within the next couple of weeks and so the students will be able to just drop their ballots, their certified envelope with the ballot inside it, right into the drop box if they have requested to vote by mail. So I've tried to do whatever I could to address this concern. Uh, I am of the opinion that students should participate uh, in our democracy, and if they so choose to vote here, the law allows for that, and I'm, I'm going to make sure that I accommodate that. Thank you. Um, Pat Simpson is asking, um, to your knowledge, has there been any evidence of attempted hacking of election systems in Illinois in this period? So um, some of this I'm not at liberty to share, um, but if there was anything that was really a major concern, then uh, it would have been announced through the State Board of Elections and through the governor's office about uh, this situation. Uh, if there was something that was a major concern. We get updates uh, pretty regularly about fishing expeditions uh, and how bad actors will try to penetrate uh, any particular system. We do know that the State Board of Elections was hacked uh, in the, I believe it was the 2016 uh, election. And, uh, but that, believe me, uh, we, we get a lot of information from STIC, from the Cyber, Cyber Navigators Program about this. So all of our experts are working on it and we do have access to that information and it is shared with us on a regular basis. 
So at this point, I do not, I'm, it's not that I'm not concerned about it, uh, but I'm allowing the experts to do their job and they will let me know what I need to do if we do run across a problem. Thank you. Um, does anyone else have any other questions? Uh, and while, we, while we're doing that, Michelle, I would love to talk about the drop boxes. Uh, this is very important. Uh, as a very progressive uh, clerk, I want to do everything that I can to create fair, free, and accessible elections for everyone. So I went out to Colorado. I was supposed to be on vacation, and I was asked to come out to Colorado by an organization called Vote at Home. I was only one of two county clerks and uh, uh, locations that were asked to come out to Colorado to witness how they work during the primary. So on June 30th, I was in Colorado in the Denver elections office watching the, uh, the process in action. And so I got to speak to election judges who were emptying drop boxes and voters who used drop boxes and saw all of the progressive ways and the the amount of investment into the elections in Colorado that we desperately need here in Illinois and in Champaign County in particular. But these drop boxes are beloved uh, in every community that I have spoken with about this and it saves the taxpayers money. So we just spent about $14,000 to get seven drop boxes in the Champaign-Urbana area. And $14,000 would go in a blink of an eye if we had to pay for the postage uh, of all of those individuals who would use the drop boxes. So if you pay, if you use a drop box, then you don't have to put your ballot and your envelope in the mail, and we don't have to pay postage if you use the drop boxes. So out there in, Cali in, uh, in Colorado, where 95% of the people vote by mail, of those 95%, 65% of them use the drop boxes to return their ballots. It takes some of the pressure off the postal service, and it also saves us all money as taxpayers. So those seven locations, if I can just share them quickly, um, Brookings Administrative Building in the Circle Drive, the Urbana Free Library in the parking lot, the quad on campus, which will only be accessible by foot and by bike for the one on, on campus, uh, Douglas Branch Library in the Circle Drive, the Champaign Public Library also I use that as a landmark more than the actual location. The drop box uh, that we're working to get put in at that location will be on State Street actually, in between the Champaign Public Library and Edison Middle School on the east side of the street. Uh, the sixth one will be at Sholem Pool, which is more southwest Champaign. There's a circle drive there. Uh, that's plenty of space for people to drive up and drop off their ballots. And then the last one will be in the parking lot of the CU Public Health District uh, in their east parking lot. So there are seven conveniently located locations, um, uh, places where these drop boxes are. They are available 24 hours a day. And they are in high traffic, highly visible areas. Many of them are under 24 hour surveillance. So they are safe and secure to use. They are locked, they are bolted or cemented to the ground. Uh, and they weigh between 325 to 500 pounds. So these are secure boxes where you can put your, your ballot in and we will pick them up daily with a Democratic and Republican election judge uh, on, on a day-to-day -day basis. Thank you. Um, so I think we have time for two more questions. Um, one, Mark is asking, do the DS-200 machines in Champaign County include modems? Um, and they're looking at an article which suggests possible problems with modem equipped, equipped DS-200s. Um, and they're linking a Politico, Politico article about um, election voting and misleading claims. Yeah, you know, I have not seen any articles about the DS-200s. I'd be happy to read that if Mark would like to send those to me. I'll be happy to, uh, to read those uh, and to look into it, but I have not heard of any concerns with the DS-200. Um, again, a lot of people think that these machines are online. These machines are not online, so they're not accessible to hacking in that regard. Uh, this is why the security measures that we have of keeping them locked up are so important and why the encrypted, military-grade encrypted thumb drives are so important to make sure that we keep those uh, safe and secure. But none of this information is uh, on the web. 
we will insert the thumb drive into the DS200 uh, with the data already loaded onto it for those voting precincts. And then when we remove that, it is put into a computer system that is not online. And then we calculate those ballots or we run the reports. And it is only after that do we then take that information and put it online when it is already finished uh, and to up, uh, upload it into our website. So, you know, there are lots of different concerns about cybersecurity. I do not support electronic voting. Uh, that is, uh, I know that we do a lot uh, about uh, around <laughs> electronics and technology in our society, but I do not support electronic uh, voting. I do want a paper ballot that will be, uh, that anyone can use and can track. Thank you. Um, so, Nicole is asking, other than voting, how can, other than voting, how can we support everyone to vote? Um, and just a quick note on that, um, Max from PIRG is, shared some links on um, how to get involved in campus voter outreach efforts. Um, so if you want to check out that link, um, they've got some really cool campaigns to make sure they, uh, they get students registered. But if you wanted to answer that, Claire Gammons, please. Sure. Uh, I started thinking about the second question. What was the first question again? Or you said um, how to get involved, how to get involved. Yes, absolutely. Listen, uh, the, the new legislation allows for even 16 year olds to serve as election judges. Uh, if you would sign up to be an election judge, that is the best thing that you can do right now, especially to have students sign up to be election judges. We know that we had uh, our, our older population tends to be uh, tend to make up our election judge pool. And we know that the many of them are concerned and we're concerned about their health during this pandemic. Uh, and we also know that students and young people were born into a generation of technology. So you're not intimidated by technology. And, and, and it's, it's very much a part of what we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis uh, and through, through, to run this election. So we do strongly encourage you to sign up champagncountyclerk.com to sign up to be an election judge. You can also just spread the word, talk about this, talk about the election cycle. So many people talk about November 3rd, November 3rd, early voting, excuse me, I don't even have to say early voting, voting begins September 24th. You have 40 days to, to participate. So talk to people about coming out early, uh, voting by mail. Talk to them about the importance of that and how it, it alleviates the pressure on the election judges. It uh, potentially diminishes the concern about spreading COVID-19. So talk to people about the safest way to vote. Individuals who, who just want to be uh, involved Find, by, find that candidate that you are behind, that you're supporting. Get out there and, and, and walk and hang literature for them. Make phone calls for them. Um, make donations. There's so many different ways that people can get involved if you want to be involved in that process. I think the demonstrations that we're seeing in the streets are also political. People are, are taking a position and saying that we want justice and equity. So being a part of, uh, of clarifying that message so that elected officials understand what's being demanded is also a way that you all can be involved. Hang on. Mm -mm. Um, so, so this will be our last question, if that's all right. Um, and it came from someone on Facebook. And the question is, what is the biggest myth around the election that you've seen? The biggest myth is that People with felony convictions cannot vote. That's a tremendous myth in Illinois. And the other one is that vote by mail is some sort of scam or, or fraudulent. Those are the two things that we run into the most and they are both uh, just blatantly false. Uh, again, individuals with felony convictions in the state of Illinois, if you are not in the penal institution, if you're not in a prison in Illinois, you can vote. So I want to make sure that that is very clear. All you have to do is get registered, go down and register, and you're going to get, you're going to get your voter registration card in the mail like everybody else, and you will be able to participate, vote for federal elections, local elections, the whole, the whole shebang. And again, this myth around vote by mail is fraudulent or somehow an, un, an unsecured process. It's just, it's just all false. Uh, we've been voting, like I said, since the Civil War. And we have some states 
California, Utah, Colorado, uh, Oregon, Washington, all these states are all vote by mail. Everyone votes by mail or 95% of the people who vote, vote by mail in those places. So um, this is the trend. This is the future of elections for, uh, for America. We need to find ways to strengthen it as opposed to looking for ways to undermine it. And with that, thank you so much for your time, Clerk Ammons, and for demystifying this election and, and telling us how to get involved um, and dispelling these myths. We really, really appreciate it. Um, and yeah, thank you everyone for attending and for your thoughtful questions. Michelle, I'm sorry, I got one more thing. Yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, I want to say to anyone out there who may be watching and who may know someone who says my vote doesn't matter, right? Well, one thing is true that in this democracy that we're, we're attempting to establish, is there another form of government that you would like to live under? If you don't think that this one is the one that you would like to live under, that's one question. And I say to individuals who, you all are students, and let's say you all wanted to go out and party and said, hey, you know what, we're gonna, we're gonna go get a, uh, to, to buy a keg from the, the local um, liquor store, right? And I'm just gonna use that as an example, right? Well, you all ante up and say, okay, I'm gonna put my money in to go get this keg. How many of you who ante up are going to say, never mind, I don't want any? It doesn't work like that. So when you pay your taxes, property taxes, real, uh, income taxes, sales taxes, that's your ante. Don't ante up and then walk away from the table. You walk away from the table when you don't vote. If you're paying taxes, make sure you cash your vote. That's how to make sure that your money counts in the way that you want it to count. Thank you. Thanks, Clerk Ammons. Thank um, you. Yeah. and. Next week, we have um, Nancy Flores from the National Partnership for New Americans, um, and she's going to be talking about her campaign to um, register 5 million new um, naturalized citizens um, as voters. So um, on this theme of voting and democracy and election, we are really excited to continue this conversation. So thank you, Clerk Ammons, and thank you, all thank for you everybody. Me. And have a wonderful weekend. Bye-bye.